In this episode, I'm joined by David Curtis, a Lama in the Shangpa Kagyu tradition of Tibetan Buddhism and founder of the Tibetan Language Institute. David reveals how a radically transformative encounter with LSD led to his leaving a career in military intelligence to dedicate himself to spiritual exploration. We discuss David's love for classical languages, the Western canon, and why conversion to Buddhism often includes a rejection of Western civilization. David tells of hitchhiking across Europe, entering a three-year retreat under the direction of influential Tibetan teacher Kalu Rinpoche, and recounts his powerful experiences there, practicing the six yogas of Naropa. So without further ado, Lama David Curtis. Lama David Curtis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, Steve. So in 1984, you first became interested in Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism in specific after you attended some teachings given by the Dalai Lama. But I'm curious about your background uh, much before that. And what led you up to your interest in, in meditation and these sorts of things? One place we could start, well, my father was a school teacher and then an administrator. And we, I went to seven different schools before I graduated from high school. And, um, but then we came to live here in Missoula, Montana, and there's a university here. And so when I graduated from high school locally, I went to the university and I remember kind of a pivotal event was that I was standing on the campus the first day with a, some of my friends from high school and we were all excited about the newness. And it was in the sixties um, this would have been 1967. So it was a very exciting time. There was, you know, it sounds a bit cliche, but there really did seem to be some kind of electricity in the air and just excitement. And um, we, I was looking through a catalog as we talked, my friends and I, we were talking about what classes we were going to take. And I saw listed in the philosophy department, a brief description that philosophy was the love of wisdom. And I just decided that was for me. That's what I wanted. And so I took a philosophy class and then wound up being a philosophy major. <clears throat> and it turned out that the, um, this particular philosophy department at this remote little uh, university was founded by a man who had a deep interest in Buddhism. And so he taught courses at the time that were called such things as introduction to Oriental philosophy. But there was that... Um, little influence there from for you know going way back and then quite some years later i took a job i came and went from the university and wound up studying classics and philosophy and i was interested in the greeks um and i took a job from a friend at a company that was owned by a person that became a very good friend and it didn't really work out it really wasn't me but they wound up hiring me to tutor their children and they were a Buddhist family. And, and he was quite a serious scholar of uh, Chinese Buddhism, Yin Buddhism. So I began to study with him and we would, and then his wife, we would read sutras and, uh, and then I was learning classical Chinese from them as well. And then um, I spent the summer in Seattle, Washington, <clears throat> And um, I would visit a little Tibetan shop. I was, I was kind of on summer vacation. And so I didn't have much of a schedule. So I would spend time in bookstores and libraries. And, and, um, and then I just came upon this Tibetan shop and I was just curious about it. I didn't know anything about Tibetan culture. And the man and I kind of became friends and I would learn a little bit about Tibetan culture when I popped in from him looking at books and tankas and whatnot. And one time I popped in and he said um, that the Dalai Lama of Tibet was going to be coming to America and giving a series of teachings in Los Angeles. And he pointed his finger in my face and said, you should go. And then when I was back at work teaching again in the fall, I just happened to mention that to my friend and employer one time, and just as a curiosity. And some time went by, <clears throat> and then he said to me in another conversation, didn't you say the Dalai Lama was coming to LA? And I, I said, yeah. And, and he said, um, doesn't your mother live in LA? 
And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you to go down and see the Dalai Lama if you take my son, who was my student. So I was teaching this very bright young guy. He was 11 years old. I was teaching him classical Greek and we were reading the college books that I had read at university, you know, um, in philosophy and history. Um, we were reading the classics in English, but we read in English, you know, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey and Herodotus. And, and uh, so anyway, we went and um, I contacted my girlfriend who was in Seattle, which was the reason I was out in Seattle that summer and suggested that she come too. And so she did. And, um, and I had this experience with the Dalai Lama, Jeffrey Hopkins, a great, great scholar was translating, interpreting for the Dalai Lama at the time. And uh, my wife, uh, my girlfriend is now my wife, we've been together ever since. And um, uh, she was a philosophy major as well. She was a real excellent scholar and student. I wasn't so much, but we both had this interest in philosophy. And so the way that Jeffrey Hopkins was translating, it was just sublime. It was just really fantastic. And we both really liked that. So the, the philosophical content you could say was just tremendously stimulating. But there was something about the Dalai Lama that was quite separate from, it seemed to me at the time from just that intellectual acumen, you know? And, and then he had something and I decided that what he had, I wanted, you know? The, that, that was just how I thought about it at the time and experience. And I want to follow up on that, what he has. And at that event, which would have been the fall of 84, they announced that the next summer he was going to be in Switzerland doing a program, which was the Kala Chakra Empowerment. And I think it was a 12 day program. And so we, um, we decided to go to that. And, and so we did. So then I thought, um, I had never been to Europe and, and Deanna had been a foreign exchange student in high school to France and then again in college and she spoke beautiful French. Um, and so um, she wanted to get back to France and see her friends in France and maybe go to grad school at the Sorbonne where she actually got accepted. And, um, and uh, so I thought that we would go to this program in Switzerland with the Dalai Lama for two weeks. And then since I'd been doing all these Greek studies, I wanted to go to Greece. It was like a pilgrimage. And so, um, so I thought perhaps we would be like two weeks in Switzerland, see some of Deanna's friends in France, and then a couple of weeks in Greece, and then back home to this beautiful job. Um, we were living in the mountains in a large home that the family gave us. Um, the, um, tutoring these children. So we worked about 20 hours a week and there were the two of us teaching three lovely children and um, in, in this spectacular place, uh, you know, in the forest on a river uh, with all the Rocky Mountain wild animals and, and then these amazing people. Um, so I thought we would do that. But one thing led to another and, and um, Deanna's friends told her, well, if you're interested in the Tibetan stuff, well, they're building a temple just down the road about an hour and a half away. This was in Burgundy. And so we went to visit and we uh, wound up um, living there for five years and, and studying and practicing the Dharma there. That's fascinating. A couple of questions come to mind. You mentioned there going to college in the 60s. And of course, 60s is famous for many things. And one of the things that uh, is something of a point in common of people of that era who in America who later became interested in Buddhism or became professionally working in that field is LSD. I'm curious if you ever took part in the uh, psychedelic um, culture of that time period. Yes. Well, curious that you mentioned that. <laughs> um, so... It was a tumultuous time for me and it didn't really work out for me at university, you know, at the time. And so um, I wound up going to Vietnam, actually. So the, um, uh, it was my inclination to, at the time you, you had two options if you didn't want to go in the military and there was the draft, you know, and, and the options were to go to prison for three years or to go to Canada forever, you know, just leave the country. 
And, and I couldn't decide which of those two to do. And then I was informed that people in my family always fought for the, our country and freedom and whatnot. And that was the manly thing to do, you know, and the right thing to do. So um, that's uh, the route I took. Um, but I decided I wasn't really into, um, I didn't want to shoot anybody, frankly, you know. And so um, I did well on some tests and then I wound up being um, an intelligence analyst. And then that led me to, um, to a year in Vietnam. But because I had a top secret security clearance, I was always in quite a safe place. And, uh, and the office was air conditioned and whatnot. So it was very remote and dangerous area, but um, where I was, but I always felt like completely protected. And when I got back from, from Vietnam, then I actually worked at NSA, the National Security Agency outside Washington, DC um, for a time. And then it's quite a long story, but at one point I, just went in and um, announced that I didn't think I could do this anymore. And um, the person in charge said, do you mean this particular project that you're on now? And, and I said, no, the whole thing. And so I wound up getting discharged um, for apathy. I got a general discharge under honorable conditions for apathy. And then part of the way things worked back then is then I, I got what they called the GI Bill, so I was able to come back to school. And then that's when I got into studying classics and returned to studying about the Greeks uh, for five years. But the thing that led to that, to my finally saying that I didn't want to do it anymore, was um, I did have an experience with LSD. And that was... I, I think I can still say that was the single most significant event in my life. It completely turned everything around. I was a very unhappy young man, you know, because I was in the military where I didn't want to be at all. And so I think I was um, cynical. And, um, and then in one evening, my life orientation completely changed uh, to the spiritual. And, and I, I came to the way that I, well, I still talk about it this way, is that I felt that the dynamic energy of the universe was actually love. And, and so um, I went through quite a change there. And so I was actually doing LSD and working for the National Security Agency and, uh, at the same time. So it was quite, uh, <laughs> quite a difficult and trying time. At the same time, I was having, you know, I felt like I was having my mind most beautifully expanded and uh, uh, just completely transformed, my whole life completely transformed. And at the same time I was doing this, which just wasn't a fit, never was from the very beginning. I wrote a paper called The History of My Apathy while a member of the army. We, so I was actively trying to get out, but if you're apathetic, you can't be actively trying to get out. So it was full of contradiction. And, and they just decided, um, I guess, to, let me go and so they let me go but then um then i was able to uh well, then the government paid for me to go to school and you know uh, unlike um unlike britain and other countries in europe for instance uh, it's a big expense to, to to go to college uh here in the states and so then that allowed me to um go into, you know, deeper and study the classics for five years. I did five more years. So I did six years as an undergraduate altogether as kind of a dilettante, but, uh, but interested. I was primarily interested in Plato and then the pre-Socratics. And, and then I fell in love with language itself, studying both Greek and Latin. And I had a bare introduction to Sanskrit as well. But um, yeah, that, that's a little bit. Uh, that's fascinating. So was it your first experience with LSD that was so transformational or was it a series? It sounds like you experimented with LSD for uh, some time period. I'm, I'm curious about the frequency and dose 
that you were experimenting with o- over that time period? And also, mm-hmm. at some point, did you stop using LSD? And if so, why? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, um, so uh, I'm not very good on uh, my memory about uh, frequency and dosages and whatnot. Um, the, um, but the first time was like, um, it was very hard to talk about, but it, but it was radically transformative. It was like a journey to a completely different dimension of reality. And uh, I, I had, well, I always say I was out of my body for about four hours. And, um, and when I came back, like everything was completely different. Descartes had some famous expression. I don't know who did it for him, but he talked about being awakened from his dogmatic slumber. And, and I was just like completely blasted out, out of mine. And then when I came back, it was actually something quite similar to the Dalai Lama experience I had years later, that um, there's something here exceedingly important and this is what life is, you know, here, and I'm going to explore this. So after a couple of years, um, I came to the conclusion that that was, um, so I had been shown, but then the task for me to do was to become that which I was shown. And so then I um, stopped doing uh, LST and any kind of drug and I started exploring different spiritual things. So I was reading the spiritual uh, literature of the world while I was an undergraduate reading Plato. And I also fell in love with the Greek tragedians. And, and, uh, you know, we were reading the the plays, which are totally fantastic. Um, um, But anyway, I think all that kind of prepared me. And then I was doing wide reading and then when I met my friend who was a Buddhist, I was just completely ready for that and just thought that that was, uh, you know, absolutely something to explore. And so then I started, you know, um, reading, we were reading a whole series of sutras. And this family was, uh, they were Chinese Buddhists. Um, and they were very interested in the perfection of wisdom teachings. So the, the translations of Edward Kanzi, for instance, um, was something that we read and, you know, starting with the Heart Sutra and um, so the, um, so yeah, and then when we met the Dalai Lama, then things just took that change towards Tibetan Buddhism. And when we visited the center in France, I realized this is a place where they cultivate, you know, the, so make that change that I've been wanting to make in my life. So I knew that there was this other spiritual reality and dimension, and that's who we were. But it's sometime, somehow, I'm not, I haven't become that. And so then when I would do LSD, it was as if I would journey there and have this excellent experience. And then I would come back. And then somehow I was still myself. There's a Paul Simon song, Still Crazy After All These Years, which you know I still like to quote uh, today. Um, but, um, but then when I found the Tibetans, th- this was like a way, you know, this was a path to get there. And then I felt that each, any effort that I made along that path was enlightening in the sense of uh, burden being uh, removed, but also more luminous. Yeah, I'm on the right track, you know, the, the, that, that old thing about the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, the, I see the light and then the farther we go down the tunnel, the more light there becomes. So the only thing to do is to keep going in this direction. And, and that's, so that was 82 that I, that I met Buddhism, I think, you know, I'd read a few books and, um, in the past, but then connected with a person that had studied with a, a, a master and there was a whole body of work to study. And then of course, when I connected with the Tibetans, it was the lineage of the late Kalu Rinpoche who passed away in 1989. And he's the Lama that first brought the, the three-year retreat form to the Western world. And that happened to be the very center where we just kind of stumbled upon in Burgundy was the very center where they had the first three-year 
meditational retreat. Mm, quite controversially, uh, he brought that, it seems. Uh, controversially at the time, anyway. First, yeah. the retreat mm -hmm. for West has received some opposition. I'm curious, um, a bit of a thought experiment, I suppose. I suppose you must have been, what, 23, 24, when you had that transformative experience with, with LSD. Uh, maybe I'm wrong about that. No, what that's right, you, exactly. Mm -hmm. What do you think What do you think your life would have been like? I'm sure you've pondered that. Had that not occurred, if you cast your mind in that direction, what, what do you think would have transpired? Well, something, another thing that really happened to me when, when I was, um, you know, 18, as, you know, just beginning the, the studies at the university, I was a very poor student in high school. I was very distracted and not focused. I was kind of into sports, um, but, um, but always reading. But I, but when I took the first classes there, they had a, a liberal arts focus and the, there was a year long humanities course that everyone had to take, I think at the time, if you were gonna get a university degree. Now there's people that can get degrees in all kinds of different things and never ever, you know, read anything of, of, of in terms of great literature. <laughs> but, but I think that had a tremendous effect on me and I found myself at home there in the study of the humanities. And I think I would have gone back there and it's possible, you know, I would have followed through with that. And I don't know, maybe wound up being a teacher or professor uh, in, the, in the humanities, either philosophy uh, or, you know, the humanities literature or something like that. I'm curious, what was it about the Greeks that captured your uh, interest so much? You know, going from not doing so well in high school and struggling, it seems, in your first uh, foray into college, then falling in love with the Greeks the second time round, and then also with language and language learning itself. I'm curious, what was it, what was it about the Greeks and about language that uh, captured you at that point? Well, I think, um, well, Aristotle said, I think in the first line of his book, The Metaphysics, he said that all people by nature long to know, reach out for knowledge. And that would, that's, I don't know about all people, but that's always been me. I've been like, I'm wildly curious. I'm curious about everything, but, and, and um, so I want to know. And then even in high school, when we read the first little bit about Socrates, I, I really liked that, what he was doing, that quest for truth. He was on a quest for truth, it seemed to me. And so was I, and maybe I wouldn't have articulated it in that way, but I just wanted to know and almost know with capital K, you know, the, like what is life and who are we? And those questions that people um, would make jokes about when I was young, you know, um, what's the meaning of life? You know, it was always in some kind of, jocular tone or something but I was interested in that so I think I was just born interested in that and my father had a very inquiring mind and he insisted that we be free thinkers you know that we really think and the worst thing that we could say was I want to do this well why because all the other kids are doing it you know the we were taught to think for ourselves and Montana is a little bit like that it's a huge state it's um 147,000 square miles and they're just now a million people you know and you know there's um uh so people are rugged individualists you know here I think by nature anyway but the um Cicero said about Socrates that he was the first philosopher that brought philosophy down from the heavens into the agora into the marketplace to be the affairs of people so and that really resonated with me. You know, he seemed to be saying that we should be asking, who am I? What's the purpose of life? And what is justice and what is good, you know, and, and virtue? And then how should governments be, you know? How, how, how should we govern ourselves, you know? And, and certainly the way that we were doing it in, became uh, evidenced in the 60s and 70s was wrong, you know, with the Vietnam War and all the rest of it. There was so much wrong, and so the so I think I've always been questioning like that and just curious and wanting to know, and then the, the Greeks, um, you know, asked these questions and dealt with these questions so intelligently and and lucidly and thoroughly that uh, that's very uh, was very enticing and very intriguing, very rich, 
very nourishing to, to that uh, questing mind that I had, I, I think. Something that interests me a lot about your background is that you have that love for the roots of Western civilization and the foundational themes and uh, thinkers and so on upon which it's built. But also you've dedicated much of your life or and also you've dedicated much of your life to the preservation and propagation of Tibetan culture or Tibetan language, certainly, and the religion, Tibetan Buddhism. And a lot of people, I think, who do the latter tend to reject the former. There's uh, quite a movement in your generation of rejection of Western culture, Western civilization, for the, the sorts of reasons you mentioned, things like the Vietnam War or for whatever re other, other reasons. So that I think that uh, rejection of Western culture, Western civilization, is quite common in those that find themselves uh, engrossed in or converting to another cultural way, another language system, another religious structure, etc. So I think it's quite unique that you have an appreciation for, you, you appear to not have lost the appreciation of the roots of Western civilization, Western culture. Can you talk to a little bit about that, um, that dynamic that I'm pointing out? Uh-huh. Yes. Um... I think I was very fortunate and even blessed was the word that actually came to mind um, to encounter the humanities in that philosophy department. So it was a teaching department. So they weren't, they didn't care about the usual thing, publish or perish and let's make our department famous for, you know, the different professors writing great books. Um, but they, they really were a teaching department and uh, the founder of the, the department <clears throat> was still there when I studied, and his name was Henry Bugbee, B-U-G-B-E-E. -E. And um, so I fell in love with the humanities, and I think I, even though I was a poor student that first year when I went, but I did always go to class. And, and just hearing those lectures and about all of, about the great books of the Western tradition, I really fell in love with that and they really resonated with me. So I think I got enough of that to recognize, no, this is, you know, maybe like Plato said, true, good and beautiful. Um, and so I, even though I didn't go very far into it at the time and, and still wouldn't say that I have, but, but, um, but I saw enough of it to recognize its uh, validity. And then um, when I had the LSD experience, um, that the first one, one of the things that came to me very powerfully was the Descartes that I had read and, and his radical doubt. We're going to question everything, he said. You know, all my cherished beliefs, what, any authority, everything's uh, open to question. And so I love that. Like, so I think I got enough of that humanities and a lot of people that were rejecting the Western culture um, perhaps had never really looked into its roots, you know, and examined and saw what it really was. Um, it, interestingly, then when we began to study with the Tibetans, many of the Tibetan teachers propagated that idea that, oh, the, the Western way is just totally crazy and the Dharma way of our Tibetan Buddhism here, this is the only way where there's any light. And so, you know, uh, just let that go and just do this. Um, and that I rejected that as, as well, eventually. And then when I had the opportunity to do a three-year meditational retreat, it came as a and it, this sounds very egotistical, but I'm going to say it anyway, because it's true. It came as a great confirmation the study of the Greeks that I'd done and the LSD experience, the experiences and the ideas that I encountered uh, from those investigations seemed completely confirmed by the experience I had in meditation. And when I, when I took up the meditation seriously um, in that three-year retreat, having dabbled in it uh, up to that point, um, that would have been um, 88, I think it was. Is, is that right? 80, some 1988. And when I, so it was, um, so I was about 40 
then. So I was 18 or 19 when I went to college and then and had the first encounter with the Western humanities tradition. And then I was 23, 24 when I had the LSD experience. And then I was 40 when I went into three year retreat. And, and so then I had that behind me. Um, you know, I returned to university and studied for five more years. Uh, so all that was behind me when I had the encounter with, with meditation. Mm -hmm. And then all of that became confirmed for me rather than to be something, now I'm going to reject that because now I'm a Buddhist. In the Alan Watts essay, Beat Zen, Square Zen, he makes the suggestion, at that time Zen was the thing that everyone was, was popular mm -hmm. at that time of that essay. And he makes the point that people getting into Zen from a, so to say, Western Judeo-Christian uh, background, more or less, culturally speaking, uh, would often bring into that encounter with Zen their own unfinished relationships with their, if you like, home religion or home tradition. And it, it always struck me as kind of a little bit like what people say about relationships, that if you don't... Uh, if you have any sort of baggage hanging over with your parents, then you're likely to bring that into your relationships. You know, this is a common psychological pop psychology thing, I guess. So I'm curious, um, given that you had such a different relationship to, if you want, your culture of origin or tradition of origin than so many of your contemporaries in Tibetan Buddhism, I'm curious how that affected your engagement with the tradition and with the culture and with its, and with its figures compared to some of your other contemporaries. I'm not really sure, um, you know, not being inside their heads exactly, but um, one of the things that Deanna and I both noticed is um, that we love to study, and study wasn't really held as the highest way uh, by a lot of, a lot of our um, compatriots, you know, a lot of our fellow um, explorers on the Tibetan Buddhist path. And so one of the things that happens to all, and happened to me too, and I think happens to a lot of us, is um, we basically fall in love with these Tibetan lamas and this Tibetan culture. It's so beautiful. And we see that ourselves as being incomplete, and then our culture being incomplete, and then we're suffering, you know, <laughs> in this culture and in this, of uh, our own head, you know, the, the self-created confines. Um, and then, then we find these liberated people and this liberated teaching. And it's like, wow, this is fantastic. So it's, um, so I understand the tendency then to reject the old, you know, this is the new and all of that, you know, is insignificant and irrelevant now, you know, the past. But, um, but I think, um, Having studied a bit more than some people, like I said before, we went far both, I don't really want to speak for Deanna, but, um, but I think both of us went far enough into Western culture that we realized the beauty and the uh, wonder that's there as well. Um, <clears throat> and the um, sometime I refer to a lot of what's happened in the West is in the absence of the sacred. There's an absence of the sacred. But if we dig deeply enough in the West, then we find that sacred. You know, if we go back to Plato, um, for just as one of many examples, but also, um, <clears throat> well, just recently I've been reading Emily Dickinson a little bit, um, but uh, Henry David Thoreau, uh, you know, was an influence. And I think we that that is there. It's not the... Uh, majority view or orientation, but it, the, there is a streak of that, like a streak of gold um, all the way through Western culture as well. And then other things have come to predominate, you know, tremendously uh, in the West. So the, um, and, then, and then I think people have never found that, um, you know, golden thread or that seam of gold uh, in, in the mountain. Um, until they encountered the Tibetan. And so then they falsely assumed that it's absent in the West where it isn't at all. Mm. Anyway, I mean, something, someone like Martin Luther King, I would 
positive, you know, very spiritual uh, person. And he was influenced by Gandhi, who was influenced by Henry David Thoreau. And so the, um, the Henry Bugby, the founder of our philosophy department, um, was somebody that was in touch with that lineage and brought that forward. And I should say about him, quite interesting, by the way, uh, speaking of Zen, um, he was teaching at Harvard and he, he told me this himself. I don't know if he ever wrote about this, but he told me this, um, that um, one time a mem he was just a first year professor not tenured, <clears throat> and they used to have the department philosophy department meetings at lunch together. And so the, um, the chair of the department announced that some memo would come to all the departments on campus that um, some Japanese supposed scholar um, was going to be uh, on campus. Someone had come up with the money to bring this person as a teacher or a lecturer um, on campus for a year, and was anybody interested in having him talk to their class? And I don't think probably of all the professors on Harvard, only two or three have, would have any idea what a, you know, a Zen philosopher was, but that was D.T. Suzuki, who was also Alan Watts's teacher. And um, so, so Henry Bugby invited Suzuki to lecture in his class. Well, he told the chair of the department, oh, I'd like to have this guy come. And, and then the chair told him, well, Henry, it's a very big university. You know, I'll certainly put your name in, but maybe, you know, he'll be in demand in other departments too. And no one on campus was interested other than, than, um, than Henry. And so, um, so Henry basically turned over his class to D.T. Suzuki the, the Zen Buddhist philosopher and acted, you know, uh, scholar par excellence. And, uh, and then they became friends. And, and after that first year, Suzuki was uh, in New York and Henry would teach up in Massachusetts in uh, Cambridge at, at Harvard. And then um, on the weekends, he would go to New York to be with uh, Suzuki. So, and then he showed me a bunch of Suzuki's books that were his own copies of, um, you know, the books that he had written with his name in them, Henry showed these to me, you know, that, uh, so there was a profound connection there, but I don't think Henry was really talked about that publicly a lot, you know, that spiritual connection with, with Buddhist philosophy. But even now it's controversial. Jay Garfield, uh, a Western philosopher professor who, after he was a PhD, um, in Western philosophy and knew nothing about the philosophy of the East, he became a Tibetan Buddhist and he wrote an article in the New York Times about how maybe we should stop calling them philosophy departments in, a, in America and Europe and we should call them Western philosophy departments because they don't teach anything other than Western philosophy. And, um, and then the, um, so that, that's still, there aren't that many uh, universities where uh, something like Tibetan Buddhism or the other schools of Buddhism and Hinduism can be taught as philosophical subjects. But Montana has been doing that, you know, in the middle of nowhere here in the wild west um, since the 60s and maybe since the 50s. And so I just happened to fall into that. And um, I didn't know anything about Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism when I started to study in that department. But like I said, that just studying the humanities, um, you know, reading the Antigone in English and things like that, and then hearing all those lectures that had, um, that just very much resonated with me and, and remains, you know, very valid and inspirational today. I'd like to ask you a bit about your three-year retreat, but to finish off this subject, what advice would you give for somebody listening or watching, who's intrigued by what you've been saying about this golden thread of the sacred and the worthwhile, perhaps, uh, ideas that are there um, throughout Western civilization. What advice would you give them in terms of reading? I think people might be surprised that a lot of the translations are actually really quite readable without necessarily any kind of guide, so, some of them anyway, not all of them. Uh, but I think yeah, the, the tone or the culture at the moment in the academy is not so positive towards the western canon primarily uh, deconstructive in nature 
or mm-hmm. um, quite uh, critical in terms of academic style. Uh, mm-hmm. So what advice would you have to somebody who wants to get a reasonable grounding or at least uh, begin to explore a little bit the humanities as you did, as in, in the way in which you did, and the texts that you uh, found to be so meaningful? I think one of the things that happened to me was the teachers in that department, you know, they were passionate about um, what they were teaching. And now at the university, they've eliminated the religious studies department at this little university here because there's no money for it. And uh, the liberal arts are just fading out uh, completely. But this is a rather eccentric recommendation that I've never made before, but it just popped into my mind as you were formulating that question. Um, Back in the 1950s, the University of Chicago uh, put together a collection of books called The Great Books of the Western World. And the very first one is an introduction and it's an essay about our hu- humanistic tradition, the, the tradition of the great books and the liberal arts. And I like to think about the liberal arts as the arts that are on the one hand for people who are free and have an inquiring mind. So they're free enough to inquire, um, but they're, studies that liberate us as well. They liberate the mind. And um, so I think that's a good place to start. You hear someone talking about why read the great books. And I don't remember who wrote that uh, essay, but it's, but it's quite good in that first volume. And then that's a set of books that almost uh, every library in America has, every public library and every university and college library, almost. If they're not chucking them into the dumpster, you know, like <laughs> see, uh, they're doing with books these days, they have too many books, so they just, um, you know, throw them away in America now. In the late 80s, then, you were in France and you entered this three year retreat. I'm curious uh, what the curriculum of that retreat was. Uh, how did you personally take to the various techniques and methods that you were taught? You know, what was your journey through that process? I assume that's where you learned Tibetan as well. Well, I like to say that I don't know Tibetan. I just teach it. Um, We took a correspondence course. It's just six lessons before uh, we went into the three-year retreat. So um, someone might be getting the idea from our conversation up to this point that um, that it's governed by... uh, rationality and, you know, planning and, uh, you know, analyzing things and making decisions. <clears throat> but it's all been um, not much like that, actually. Um, the um, I was thinking of writing um, a story um, about my life sometimes, but it seems like a very egotistic venture. So I've never uh, put pen to paper exactly about it. But um, when I was in Vietnam, I was completely bored sometimes because we were fenced in. And it turns out it was kind of like a little retreat place um, because we had these top secret security clearances. So they didn't want anyone to capture us. And we learned later that uh, the Marines that guarded us were actually uh, given orders that if we were over, ever overrun, they were just supposed to shoot us because of the sensitivity of the information that we supposedly had. So a few times with a friend, I went hitchhiking right in the middle of, um, you know, the war. So that became kind of a metaphor for me personally, when I thought about my life, just hitchhiking in Vietnam, like everyone else is on a mission and they're doing something and they're going somewhere. And, uh, I'm, I'm a little clueless. Like in the sixties, there was an expression spaced out. <clears throat> and the very first time I heard the words, some people were referring to me, you know, <clears throat> as being someone very spaced out. <clears throat> so I struggle with knowing, especially when I lived in Los Angeles, I, I didn't know what season it was often. And someone would say things like, well, when spring comes, and then I would have to pause and go, oh, yes, okay, we're in November, you know. Uh, but... um, um So everything, so because I'm hitchhiking, then the opportunities open to me. And um, I've, I've been a lazy and distracted 
uh, student and scholar. So I, I'm not really a scholar, you know, because I'm too uh, distracted and ill disciplined, you know. Um, but um, so things just happened to me on the, on the model of like hitchhiking. And so after I left the army and before I went to college, I had a period of uh, wandering and I would hitchhike. And so Montana is on the Canadian border. And a few times I hitchhiked to Mexico and then hitchhiked through Mexico and then back. And if someone asked me, where are you going? You know, I would say Mexico, you know, and then once I was in Mexico, where are you going? I, I didn't really have a destination. It was more about the, the adventure of going. When we were first in France, before we connected with the, with the Dharma Center, um, when I wanted to go to Greece, we didn't have any money. And so um, my partner, so I said, well, it's not a problem. We'll just hitchhike from Burgundy to Greece. And my partner said, no, that's not for me. And so I went by myself. And um, so I knew a bit about Greece. And I had a wonderful adventure meeting fantastic people on the way. And when I got to Greece, um, I hooked up with a couple of young people and I was kind of the tour guide because I knew more about things than they did. And um, one of the guys, it was a young guy and a young woman, they, um, someone found a flight to Crete. And I think it was like 3 a.m. or something, but it was a really cheap flight to Crete. And I was almost completely out of money, but I wanted to see the great museum um, that they have in um, Heraklion, the capital of Crete. And I realized if I took this flight, I could stay one night in a hostel and then ride the ferry back and then hitchhike back to France. Um, and so when um, we arrived in Heraklion, we walked downtown and then it was, there was something very, very strange. The, there was um, um, what looked like uh, like 17th century fortifications out in the harbor and then a building that we later learned was the armory, an ancient armory, and, but they were somehow connected into one large building. And we were walking down the road and the road ended at this, what looked like medieval wall, you know? Uh, and we were very confused what was going on. And so at one point I looked around the wall and then I saw all these two by fours and structure. And then I tapped on the wall and it was some kind of plastic. So what it was is that downtown had been made into a movie set. And um, because I didn't have any kind of agenda or wasn't going anywhere to make a long episode short, I wound up being an extra in a Franco Zeffirelli film, uh, a, a Verdi's opera, Othello or Othello. Um, and so I, so I got to dress up and be in this movie and be paid for it. Um, for um, five or six weeks. And I would meet people like American tourists or European tourists who are obviously wealthy people. And, and one time a guy said to me, oh man, I'd love to do that. That's like so cool. But, and I said, you can do it, you know, just this. Is, and he said, no, no, I've got a flight to catch, you know, and then I've got to go. So he has an agenda. So because I had no agenda and I wasn't really going anywhere, then this experience opened and when the experience opened for me, I was able to, you know, follow into it, you know, like people refer to the rabbit hole. I was able to like go down into that rabbit hole and have a wonderful experience meeting people from all over the world and being part of a major film, you know, won the Palme d'Or at the, the Cannes Film Festival the next year. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> I had no qualifications whatsoever, you know, I was just there and then willing to take part in the experience. So my whole life has kind of been like that, I'm not very qualified, but uh, curious. And so then these things um, unfold for me. And then I've been fortunate enough to, to, um, to let go of, of, you know, a gender or what I should be doing or supposed to be doing. And aren't you a little bit old now? And I would be wandering the halls at the college here. It's just, um, five blocks away from where we are, um, where, where I'm sitting now. Um, 
And people would ask me every now and then, are you in grad school or did you get your PhD yet? Are you teaching or what are you doing? And I said, no, I'm just an undergraduate still studying. So after some years, I decided to get a degree partly so people would stop asking me, you know, uh, or I'd have to say, no, I don't have any kind of degree at all. And then, but one day um, I was taking a, a philosophy class and it was a summer. So it's like really like everything's really truncated, really short. It was like four and a half weeks. Um, uh, semester and it was on great philosophers and we were doing the Greeks and this young graduate student I think he at the time was 23 or 24 himself and when we were reading Plato we would write these Greek words on the board and then he kept saying to really get this you have to learn Greek if you really want to get this you have to learn Greek and so I told myself oh I'll just do that next semester you know I'll learn classical <laughs> Greek next semester and so so then I went in to study that and it's totally impractical. And so people would always want to know, what are you going to do with that degree of philosophy or classical languages? What are you going to do with it? And I never had an answer. And I suppose now, you know, if I, I, I don't lead the reflective life, I don't know, like, I'm not going to, you know, you know, so it's, I wasn't on a career plan and I'm find a job plan which has, comes along with its own suffering and difficulty, you know, the, the, my fellows, you know, that decided to go into computers or something, you know, back in, at that time, you know, the, have a very uh, different experience and different life. But I, I see my life as like, kind of like, it's samsara and I'm kind of hitchhiking in samsara. And then, then you get in and, and then you're going where the ride is going, right? So, <laughs> and so one thing has just led to another like that. But I think there's kind of um, a beam that I'm following and it's, it's just that curiosity and that wanting to know. And then also um, one thing, a Buddhist thing that um, that's maybe a minority opinion, it seems to be, it, for instance, um, people take this concept of the bodhisattva and they ascribe to that and even take bodhisattva vows. And so my understanding of the bodhisattva is someone, it actually has the word heroic in it in Tibetan. The, it doesn't, bodhi and sattva is pretty much like enlightenment being or being tending towards enlightenment in the Sanskrit. But, but in Tibetan, it's someone who's heroic who has their mind set on enlightenment. <clears throat> and that, then the teachings tell us that that's for, not just for oneself, but for the benefit of all beings. And for me, it's implied in that, that I'm not there now, you know, I'm not a Bodhisattva now, I'm certainly not a Buddha now, and I'm certainly not a Bodhisattva now, but that's the goal. But then when one takes that vow, one acknowledges that one has work to do, considerable work to do on, my, on oneself. And so then one has dedicated oneself to engaging in that process of becoming the Bodhisattva, training oneself to become that. So then just like Cicero said of Socrates, for me that brings Buddhism and philosophy down to our human level. Who are we as people and our relationship with each other and the planet? And where am I right now? And um, one of my teachers was Khandro Rinpoche, the woman Rinpoche. I just read a quote by her and she points out that when, when you start this spiritual path and start meditating and looking at your own mind and examining your own mind, and that's certainly what happens when we do LSD, um, um, then one sees that one's not quite an enlightened, perfected being yet. And so then for me, that then illustrates for us the work that needs to be done. There's work that needs to be done. And then when we take the Bodhisattva vow, then that's a commitment to engage in that work. So we say these prayers, you know me, I become a Buddha for the benefit of all beings. So I think we have to commit to do the work. I mean, I'm just speaking ideally. I'm not making any claims for myself along these lines, but the, um, that we commit to do what we can to um, engage in that transformative process. But it's about transforming and changing me, you know, like each of us, but with that lofty goal for the benefit of everyone. But that's an, 
that part about um, actively engaging and changing oneself, that's, mm, that's hard work. That's where it gets non-abstract. It's, you know, so to go to the lovely rituals and get the empowerments and all the teachings, um, it's fantastic. It's wonderful. But it's a little bit like vacationing, you know, in Dharma land. Um, and so, and so there's a connection with the, with the LSD, my personal encounter with the LSD experience like that. Partly I was shown who we are. You know, I love that teaching of Buddhism. I think coming from Nagarjuna about the two truths, the relative and then the absolute, we could say. So in the absolute, we're all awakened Buddhas, infinite Buddhas. But then at the same time, it's quite paradoxical at the same time, in the relative, well, I'm not, you know, like, um, I, you know, I'm not there. So I am and I'm, I'm not. And so somehow I think the path of Buddhism and, and our life path is really has this purpose to get those two in sync, you know, as much as we can for as long as we're here. That's what it seems to be to me. So we're all on a mission um, and I realize that's paradoxical because I've just been talking about hitchhiking where you don't have a mission, but it's almost like you have a spiritual inner mission that um, is separate from, you know, one's job title and what one does to, uh, you know, make money, put bread on the table, whatever. But so I, I have a feeling that um, when we were a kid, we used to play with magnets and iron filings and put a bunch of iron filings on a piece of paper or whatever with the magnet below. To me, the fact that we all have Buddha nature, that's calling us, calling us on the spiritual path. Uh, you know, in philosophy, you know, the love of wisdom, that's the spiritual path. And it's calling us. And then we have all kinds of obstacles in the way that we're not connecting and we don't really get on board with that. Um, and so then working on oneself, we're, we're trying to overcome those obstacles and, and surrender to that. Uh, I really think it's a calling, a, a spiritual calling that we have in life. And then we look around and, well, we don't talk about that. You know, people don't talk about that in the Western world. And, uh, you know, religion, that's for Sunday, you know, um, something like that. But I, th I think that's uh, back to the Aristotle quote. That's who, that's who we are. That's that's of our, our very uh, luminous, enlightened, our, our Buddha nature. That's who we are. And so we're never going to be happy and never going to be fulfilled until we start actualizing that, making that real in each of us, in ourselves, in our own being. <laughs> I got carried away a bit there. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, amazing. So I'm curious, you know, when we're talking about the three-year retreat or we're starting to talk about the three-year retreat, to a lot of people that hear that three retreat, wow, three years, closed retreat, intensive study and training period of meditation and all sorts of things there. What was the curriculum? I understand uh, in that three retreat, the Shankar Kagyu um, approach, there's also, this, for instance, the famous six yogas of Naropa is covered, among other things, the Yidam practice, et cetera, et cetera. What was the curriculum during that time? What methods and techniques did you cover? And how did you take to them? Uh-huh. Well, um, every now and then someone asks me, so we had 33, I believe it was, different um, Yidam meditational deity practices that we did. <clears throat> and some of them were for two weeks and some of them were for five months, I think. But I don't even remember what they were. And so every now and then, if someone asked me, did you do X, Y, Z? Then I asked Deanna, you know, did we do that? And she said, yeah, we did that in the second year for three months. I went, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. Now I remember uh, we did do that. Um, one thing I'd like to say about it. Um, so this characteristic that I have is quite exasperating for a lot of people that know me, I think, uh, in former years. Now, most of the people I know are and spend time with are Buddhists. Um, well, one little anecdote. So we had an attendant, a fellow that um, would bring us our mail and would do shopping for us. And each of us had to cook um, 
for himself in our retreat. In previous ones, they had someone cook for the whole group, but then um, that's a very difficult job because, um, well, we were from, I think there were, just roughly speaking, there were 10 men and 10 women. I think there were nine guys and 10 or 11 women. And we were from nine countries. So, um, but anyway, this attendant one time, the, the ten attendants have a unfortunate job of having the, you were talking about relationship with parents and family and then so, uh, people in retreat bring their issues with that the, on to you know, everybody else in the retreat. And then especially this person that's not doing the retreat, that's the attendant and the cook, you know? So it's pretty hard to cook for 10 people from a half a dozen different cultural backgrounds. And even if they're from the same country, you know, different backgrounds uh, and please everybody. So anyway, the cook is a very stressful job and people seldom can make it three years as a cook. And so when it was our turn, the, the abbot of the center just said, you guys are just cooking for yourself. We're not going to deal with that. Anyway, so the, so the attendant fellow, um, a wonderful guy, he stopped me on a trail one time. So uh, the little retreat center where we were, I paced it off one time and it was um, 36 paces by 24 paces. And inside there were little houses for 15 people to do retreat a kitchen, a bathhouse, a yoga studio, and a temple, all in that small space. And I was in the far corner. And, and so I had the longest walk to like get to the kitchen. It was 21 steps. That's as far as you could go in one direction. And so he was walking one day on this little trail and I on the, on the other, I don't remember where either of us were going, but he stopped me and he kind of looked around and said, how's this going for you? And I think we'd been in about three months at the time. And I said, it's the strangest thing I've ever experienced. We've been here three months and it feels like a weekend to me. So whatever was going on, I fell into it and I was lazy and distracted and I'd be late for my private meditation sessions and, you know, um, um, not a great, uh, exemplar, you know, of the ascetic life or anything. Um, but I felt at home there. And, um, and I loved it all. And, it, and things were happening on multiple dimensions. Um, for one thing, we slept sitting up. And, and then we were in this little box, um, about a foot high. And, um, and at the diagonal, it was the length of your legs. You know, and so that you could never sort of sitting straight on, you could never really stretch out your legs. And we slept there and then meditated there and had meals there. And so we just were in this little box confined. But I was talking to a young woman who was new to the spiritual life and Buddhism. And I was talking about how I spent three years um, looking at this curtain that had a, um, a the, the fabric was um, just some kind of polyester, but an Asian theme. It had peacocks on it. And um, it was kind of a golden yellow color. And I just spent a great deal of time looking at the space in between the peacocks where there wasn't anything. So I was trying to look at nothing, you know, and, and then in the process, one encounters one's own mind. And and then she was just astounded. She's a great lover of the mountains and hiking and biking. And um, as a lot of people here in Montana are. Um, and she was just astounded at how that could at all be interesting or, or hold my interest. And you're not going outside and you're not going on hikes and you're not swimming and biking and, and you're just sitting there. And for me, then the whole LSD experience and um, all the life experiences, it, it all came back there, you know, into the, and the mind is the most amazing adventure and thing to explore um, in the universe, I think. And I love traveling and going to other countries and meeting people from different places. But um, 
So it was an opportunity. And then that's what we were supposed to be doing there. You know, if you said, you know, so if I would have said, you know, while I was in college um, or at different jobs that I've had, you know, like, what are you doing? You know, well, I'm just kind of taking a little time to explore my own mind. You know, that's not accepted in the society that I'm from. But that's what the whole curriculum was about, really, you know. Um, and then all these different manifestations, all these different deities and all these different practices and very, very rich things like um, a two-week intensive in um, the mind training and the tonglen, the taking and sending, um, where we take on all the suffering and difficulty of others and the whole world into ourselves and then we breathe out light and love and joy to the other persons who are exchanging our happiness for their suffering really the just to be able to do that for two weeks intensively and supported by that you know the, so i felt the whole society and even the whole universe was supporting our being there and practicing and doing that and like it was a great blessing and really wonderful and i didn't have very much money and i can't cook you know, it's a joke in my family um, and people that know me. One time, um, a, a woman that was in, uh, um, into all kinds of health food and healthy life and yoga and whatnot um, told me that, you know, she said, you know, David, if you cooked, your body would love you. And so every now and then I would like making a peanut butter sandwich when my jokes in the family with my family would be like, my buddy loves me, you know, I'm cooking. So I was, I'm a little slow on the uptake about something. So even though I played sports as a youth, it wasn't until um, four years ago that I took up with yoga. So I completely fell in love with yoga and I recognized something coming together there too. My relationship with my body and sports. But then when I got into my casual life with academia and, and the spiritual life, I say casually because I'm distracted and lazy. Um, I kind of went into a phase of ignoring my body. And, um, and then I started doing um, yoga. And I, from the very first lesson, I thought, this is amazing. This is something completely amazing. And one time I left Montana in the winter in the middle of a blizzard and I was hitchhiking. And I was aimed at Arizona because I wanted to find a yoga instruction, you know, and that was back in the 70s. And it just never worked out one thing after another. But now it's like a major part of my life. And I'm completely in love with yoga. And I keep, I, I study with um, an amazing uh, woman named Isabel Roussel. And um, she, she has videos up and um, and so that's been another thing that it's just like a complete delight. And I feel completely at home and I completely love it. And what a blessing to have that in, in my life. But it came about in a very haphazard way. The, uh, I actually wound up in the hospital. People thought I was having a heart attack from just being stressed out. And I was sleeping five, five and a half hours, maybe a night, and then doing a lot of caffeine. And there's just infinite work to do. So work, work, work all the time. And then I just crashed and burned. And then when I hit bottom, as it were, they gave me every test in, under the sun and my heart was excellent. <laughs> the, the doctor said, you have the heart of a runner, you know, like a, an athlete. Um, so that's not the problem. And then I realized, um, you know, the, um, I was a little imbalanced there. So I just took yoga as an experiment. And then it, it's been a, uh, a whole nother ray of uh, luminosity coming into my life and just a great blessing. But I'm kind of like that, you know, kind of thick and stumbling around and then something happens and I go, oh, this is, this is actually good. This is beautiful. So we should keep this. We should nurture this. And I love the Tibetan concept of cultivation. I think that's what we're doing. We're cultivating ourselves. That word meditation, there's the Tibetan word gom and it can mean meditation, but it can mean, as Tony Duff points out in his remarkable um, Tibetan English dictionary called the Illuminator, that um, it's to meditatively cultivate. So it's, it's like the concept of cultivation and meditation. That's what we're doing when we're meditating, is we're cultivating these inherent qualities that we have. And I love that part of the teaching too, that we have um, all of these um, 
inherent infinite beautiful qualities such as love and compassion and wisdom and um they're kind of obscured uh now and so then we engage in this practice to both diminish the and the tibetan word for uh Buddha is Sangye, some people say Sanjay, Sangye. And the Sang idea can both mean to awaken. So you could say we're awakening from the sleep of ignorance, back to Descartes and his uh, being woken up from his dogmatic slumber. We're waking up from that. But it also has an idea of like purifying. So back to the gold, we're purifying the dross, that, that part which is not gold, purifying that away. And then at the, so that's the Sang part. And then the gay can mean to develop, to expand, to blossom. So then we're blossoming the beautiful qualities inside. And I think here in the relative world, we've got that, that's the work. That's, and so that's what it is to be a Buddhist. So when people ask me, well, what's a Buddhist? That's what I say. It's someone that's actively engaged in trying to diminish that negative, you know, things like greed, hatred, delusion. We're trying to diminish that, conquer that maybe and uh, tame it. And then we're trying, at the same time, we acknowledge the beauty that's in each of us, even the most crazy corrupt politician or criminal or whatever has this beautiful, beautiful nature as well. And so we're engaged in that twofold process. Um, and, and then that's a complete joy because then our self, the, our true reality, um, it then begins to shine and to come out. Um, Victor Hugo said that, that everyone wants to be loved for who they are in spite of their negative side. And even because of that too, you know, that, that's the thing that brings people the most joy when, when they encounter um, love of another, you know, the, the other loves them. And so the, um, well, I think really, it sounds a bit 60s uh, perhaps, but I really do think love is what it's all about. And I love the conjoining of love and wisdom you know, those two sides together. The Tibetans, they don't talk about it a whole lot, but very often, well, there's something that's called the three protectors, Gunpo Sum. And so they have different deities represent them, which are symbolic archetypes. But one's love and compassion, another one's wisdom, and the third one's power. So those protective deities with the flames around them, they represent that power. So when we, I found when we integrate those three things together in anything that we do, it's probably going to go well and we're probably on the right track. You know, does this have wisdom and insight? Um, that's good. And does it have power? And in the West, we kind of go with those two. The wisdom and insight kind of becomes intelligence and knowledge and then power and then we run with that but we leave the love and compassion out of it and that was a complaint with those of us that did lsd that were regard you know classified as being hippies you know back in the day is i think people didn't articulate it exactly but this is my explanation of it that's what we saw when we did lsd and when we did you know, different psychedelic other substances, mushrooms, peyote, whatnot. Peyote is popular in, in the West, Western states and the U.S. Um, the, um, that we saw that, that's missing. So it's almost um, like you have um, spokes on a wheel and then one third of the spokes are gone you know, and then the wheel's trying to roll. So it's got that intelligence and the power thing. And it's like cruising, and then it goes ka-chunk, ka-chunk, you know, all the time. And so we start to rebuild those spokes by the cultivation of love and compassion. And then you start to have a complete wheel, you know, that then, then, then your life starts to roll a little bit. And so I always like to say when I start talking like this, that I myself and still completely crazy, you know, um, but I think I recognize when Ram Dass in his wonderful book that was a life changer for me, the Be Here Now book. To me, that, that was a manual for trans, transitioning from the psychedelics um, to the, the actualization. So we don't need to stop doing psychedelics. I chose to myself. I'm quite curious about them again, actually, now. I'm entering a phase. I'm very curious to, uh, I'm thinking about um, go visiting there again. But um, 
But the main point of it was not to just have that experience. In, this was in the Tibetan tradition too. When, um, when I think it was Milarepa, when Milarepa started having experiences and then telling Marpa about them and quite excited, but it also, well, I guess it was Milarepa's student Gampopa. Gam, when Gampopa started studying with Milarepa, he started having these amazing experiences that anybody else would build a whole life on and he would run back to his teacher and, and, uh, and, and Milarepa would tell him, yeah, that's fine, that's cool, but it's just an experience and you know, go back and meditate. So it's not about the experience, it's about making it real, about actualizing it, about becoming it, about surrendering to the infinite the infinite love, wisdom, and power that's within us. And we can't leave one of those parts out. Sometimes I think the wisdom part gets left out by people, they have devotion. And so they put a lot of energy and power and they're good hearted people um, into their spiritual practice, but they're kind of living, leaving out uh, the, um, the wisdom and the insight part. So I think we all want to be cultivating all three of those all the time. And then that's what you find in something like the three-year retreat. There are different practices that address these each of the different aspects. For instance, there's Chen Rezig or Avalokita is the bodhisattva of love and compassion. So the, my current um, teacher the last couple decades is Anam Tupchen Rinpoche. And I remember one time we were walking in a Dharma center um, um, in Hawaii, and we were both there for different reasons, and it was like kind of a magical uh, coming together. And I, I remember very clearly, uh, we're walking after this rainstorm back to a, a house for uh, for an evening meal, and I had done this study of the perfection of wisdom sutras before I met the Tibetans. You know, before I got into that part. And so it's, of course, a major part of the Tibetan tradition as well. So I'm really fascinated about that. And so I was asking him about the um, representation of the perfection of wisdom as the female deity, Prajna Paramita, or, and then Tibetans just call her Yung Chenmo, which is the great mother. So I love that, the, the great mother. And so, so I had run into this notion numerous times before, but I just remember on this particular instance, it really clicked and I got it in a way that I'd never gotten it before. And then this Tibetan Lama said to me, she's an archetype, an archetype. And so, you know, that Jungian term. And then somehow that was just another instance of the Western perspective and the Eastern perspective clicking and coming together, kind of like the yin yang and, and being one, and then things rolled <laughs> for me. But I'd, I'd heard that before. I'd probably even said it on numerous occasions myself before, but somehow the way he said it right at that time, um, I think my mind, I don't know, I was just at a place maybe on the path where that just really connected. And that's something that, um, we uh, forget. One of the big problems that we have as human beings in general is reification, which uh, I know what, you know what that means, but I, I jokingly, not entirely jokingly, but I call that thingification. You know, we thingify reality and then we make these things solid. And then this thing I like, so then I want to hang on to it and I don't want it ever to change. I don't want it to go anyplace else. You know, I'm so and then all kinds of difficulty happens there. But we have a tendency, we uh, novice Western people like myself taking up with this profound tradition, it's a subtle kind of reification and thingification that we put on then the deities. And so then we make them a solid fixed thing. Even though it, all the time we talk about emptiness and, and emptiness is, like, is a, an attempt to articulate non reification I think. So we, we can't, even in an abstract way, we can't um, reify concepts like emptiness even, or Buddha, or Buddha nature. The, but that's the human mind, the mind of the person in samsara as we are, that's a natural thing for us to do. But it's also a limiting and confining um, thing that we so that's one of the things we have to overcome 
that tendency. So then when we thingify, like I'm a thing and you're a thing, so then we have two, then we have duality and <laughs> all kinds of problems. And I like to think in kind of a Greek mythology kind of way that um, when I mistakenly posit thingify myself, reify myself, and then I reify the other, then it's like those two then mate and give birth to all the afflictions. So all the greed, hatred, delusion, jealousy, vanity, all of that comes out of this un inauthentic, dualistic relationship that I have with the world. So I have a dual dualistic relationship with myself and what I think I ought to be, I ought to be accomplishing, for instance, you know? So um, rather than going inward and discovering who I am and what, what I am. Ralph Walder Emerson one time said, um, in talking about the absolute, it's not a thing, it's not something, it's somewhat. And I think that was his clever way to try to transcend uh, reification and duality. There, there is some reality there. Well, strangely enough, the way that things happen and the interconnectedness of things and the illusion of time and space and all that. Um, the, um, in that book, Be Here Now, uh, Ram Das quotes many spiritual masters from many different traditions, Black Elk, Native American, you know, Tibetans, Hindus, Taoist, Zen, all over the place he's quoting. And I didn't recognize it at the time, but he quotes Kala Rinpoche in a quote that's become almost uh, my motto. And then years later, so I first read that book about 72. And then when I was teaching the children in 82, so a decade later, I found the book. The, the house that I was given to live in had a library of 20,000 volumes. And so um, when I wasn't teaching, you know, I was reading, but I found Be Here Now again and, and started reading it again and just looking through it. And I found that quote and it was by Kalu Rinpoche. And he said, you live in illusion and the appearance of things. And I'm like, that's definitely true. But let's see, you live in illusion and the appearance of things. There is a reality. So I think when I did LSD that I contacted a higher form of reality than I'd ever imagined existed. Um, but then he goes on to say, you are that reality. When you understand this, you'll see that you are nothing. And then people freak out when I tell them that. You see that you are nothing, he says, and being nothing, you are everything. So this false positive ego David trip that I'm on, that's the part that's nothing. And when you recognize that, that that's nothing and you actually completely realize that, then you're everything. So that's still one of the guiding uh, quotes of my life. I have these guiding quotes in my life. You live in illusion and the appearance of things. There is a reality. So just going that far, that's quite significant statement. There is a reality. It's not, you know, so the nihilistic people or nihilists, they um, say nothing matters, you know, there is no reality anyway. But anyway, you live in illusion and the appearance of things. There is a reality. You are that reality. When you understand this, you'll see that you are nothing and being nothing, you are everything. I, for me, that's one of the wisest things that's ever been said. And so it's quite interesting that I read that in 72 and then I read that again in 82. And then the mother of the family gave the father, the family of whose children I tutored, um, a book. For, well, they each you know, gave each other stacks of books for Christmas one year, the year that I was there. Uh, we, I was there two years, but one of the years. And the book was um, by Lawrence Durrell, and it was A Smile in the Mind's Eye. And when I saw that book, like, like what a great title. I love that title, Smile in the Mind's Eye. And it was about his encounter with a Taoist master. Um, and then on holiday, he tells a story in the middle of that book of going to Burgundy to visit a Buddhist center for the New Year's, um, the Tibetans call it Losar, the Losar celebration. And just as things happen, um, that he's going to the center where we wound up living. Six months later, 
So I read the book and what a marvelous story. And I'm very, I love the Taoist tradition and, and teachings. And so it very much resonates with me. Um, and so, and then I like his writing and it's very fun little book. And I just thought how nice and then put that aside. And then it wasn't six months later, we were, I think it was six months. I might have a chronology wrong a little bit, but anyway, that's the center in France where we wound up um, with no forethought and planning whatsoever. You know, uh, Deanna's friend just saying, well, they're building a center down there and let's go visit. And so, you know, one thing led to another. And after I got back from, from Crete, I was, um, staying in my aunt's house in Munich, and she was back in the US. And, um, and Deanna speaks German as well. And so uh, Deanna had got accepted to the Sorbonne and she was in line to register and, and she was gonna study philosophy and it was a lifelong dream, you know, for many years dream. And then it was all coming true. Someone gave her a flat for free to live in in Paris. So she had a place to live and then she was accepted to study philosophy you know, at her dream school. And she was in line to register. And I, I think like over an hour in this long line and she got right up to pay. And the woman said, that's gonna be 1600 francs or whatever. And she said, I'm sorry, never mind. I changed my mind. And she borrowed a bicycle and went to the Dharma center um, that we had visited. And, and uh, meanwhile, I was in Crete um, with the movie and, and um, um, and then I came back to Munich and then we would talk on the phone. It was before cell phones. And I would say, you should come to Munich. It's fantastic. You know, we visited before and, you know, there's the state Bavarian state library has a huge collection of Dharma books and Tibetan amazing things like Tucci's painted scrolls, a book like this of Tonkas. Um, and she said, well, you should come to the Dharma center. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know. There's so much like me. I'm, I'm definitely planning on coming there, you know, but by and by, you know, <laughs> and, and she would, and so why don't you come to Munich and we'll have a lovely holiday in Munich. And she said, no, this is too amazing at the Dharma Center. So, so, um, so then I hitchhiked um, from Munich um, to Burgundy through an amazing, another amazing blizzard, one of those blizzards with cars in the ditch, you know, and trucks turned backwards and everything um, to arrive there. <clears throat> but anyway, so, so somehow I found myself at home and, and th that which was <clears throat> being proffered in the three-year retreat was addressing straight to my heart, straight to my heart. And I was still lazy about it and distracted and whatnot, but at the same time, I was in love. I was, I was in love with that experience. And it had like being in love with another person, you know, there's the ups and the downs and the difficulties and frustrations and all of that as well. But it was definitely a love affair and I felt completely blessed. And, and Deanna and I didn't know it, but individually we each spoke with the abbot when we were, so it's 39 months long. So when we were about month 36, you'd start thinking about, well, what's gonna happen next? You know, this is gonna end. And we each in an interview with him separately, not knowing um, that the other was having the same experience, we both said to him, we don't wanna leave. We just wanna stay here and do this for the rest of our life. And he told each of us, you're out of here. You know, you, now, now we've given you this experience. Now you have to go out and help people. It's fascinating. Something you, uh, in our correspondence, you mentioned that you had a dream about us having an interview. But I'm curious uh, if you explored particularly deeply Milam or dream yoga in that three-year retreat, and to what extent, if any, dream practice or the intuitive realm and so on plays in your life, and played in your life uh, going forward from that time? Yeah, that's uh, quite to the point, that question. Um, so I think most people I've met my life regard me as an intellectual and so i have intellectual interests but i'm lazy about that you know so, so i've never gotten i've never been to grad school and gotten an advanced degree um but i have that side to me you know i, I love intellectual things and and hearing educated people talk <laughs> about them and um but um but I think all along I've been intuitive too. And, and, and my hitchhiking metaphor 
is really um, maybe a way to talk about how I've been more led by intuition than rationality and intellectual analysis, which is bizarre because then I worked for the government as an intellectual analyst, supposedly, you know, and I wasn't very good at that either. And my heart wasn't in it at all. Um, but they selected me to do that and then trained me to do that. So I have some karma with that. But um, the retreat is a graduated experience. It goes step by step by step. So even if someone has engaged in the preliminary practices and, tantri and then advanced tantric practices, when you go into the three-year retreat, you start all over. So it's like going to the first day of school and there's not much schooling and it. it's more practice oriented. And, and then it is graduated. And so you go through the preliminary practices at the beginning and then work your way up. So we did things like the mind training, Lo Jung I was talking about. And then the pinnacle in that Changpa Kagyu uh, tradition, as you pointed out, is what are sometimes called the six yogas of Naropa. And um, like illusory body is one of them. And then that, the Milan, the dream yoga is another one. These kind of things so some of the meditations, I should say, uh, um, before I get to this uh, point about Milam, they have an analytical aspect. You know, there's a tremendous amount to visualize. So you read and then you visualize like a deity and all fine detail about the deity and this whole process. And then some of the six yogas, like... Um, the illusory body one and the, and the dream one are two that are coming to mind for me. They have far less of that. Um, and so then they really draw on our intuitive uh, gift, our intuitive capacity uh, very much. And so, and then there has to be a, a great letting go, like Poa also. Poa is the ejection of consciousness uh, from the body. So those three are coming to mind of the six for me right now. And they all have a strong letting go and surrendering into the intuitive knowingness aspect to them. So um, yeah, that I have powerful uh, experiences uh, with, with those. Uh, and all oh, the tumos, another one, the generation of heat. There's a, you're, there's quite an active, and you're involved in visualization. But when the rational mind starts to analyze that, it sounds ridiculous and unbelievable. And you know, um, but um, even though I'm distracted and unstudied and lazy and whatnot, um, I had uh, significant experiences with at least three of those uh, six yogas that were undeniable, undeniable direct experiences. So when people use the expression and say things to me, that was just a dream, or that was just a hallucination that you experienced in under the influence of LSD, I don't accept that uh, language, that just a dream or just a hallucination. It's an alternate, experience but it's um and then it may be illusory ultimately speaking but so is this you know experience you and i are having today here um, um so that was part when i mentioned earlier that the three-year retreat was confirming of my past experience like with lsd the um, i could never be convinced all along from 71 and 72 up until the present at any point when people were would uh, put down the LSD experience or the psilocybin or peyote experiences because I had those experiences myself and they were a direct encounter with something that was real. Maybe not ultimately real, so maybe ultimately illusory, but there is some reality there that I myself directly encountered. And so it's just like um, 
in experiences that I've had out in nature. When I was a little kid, our school, the tiny little school I went to would have a, um, a spring uh, picnic and time away from the school. And we would go someplace beautiful. And then, and then people would play um, softball or, you know, different games. And I was really into sports. So I always played um, and I love baseball. So I would play the, um, get very involved in those games. And that was a major part of what the picnic was about. But one time I just got the urge to climb the mountain that was beside where we played. And two other guys went with me and we were somewhere in the, around 12 years of age. And as we were going up, we were following this little stream and we just kept going and getting higher and higher. And then we could look down and see the people playing the game. And um, after a while, both of my fellows uh, dropped away and I just kept going by myself. And I found a place where the stream just shot out of the mountainside. It was the, what the French call the source, right? It was like, phew. so for me, it's an archetype and metaphor for, for life too. I just kept going and I found the source and I sat up there and it was such a beautiful experience. It's something I wasn't planning that I had never thought of uh, having that kind of experience and like sometimes streams come out of the ground you know obviously um and but but there i was experiencing that and it was before i knew anything about the spiritual life i learned the word spiritual the first time i did lsd then that became a word and a reality for me before it wasn't and spirit was like spiritualism you know 19th century where people trying to talk to ghosts of uh dearly departed you know and that was it and and that kinky weird thing that people did you know uh, back in the 19th century that was my idea of it but but then i was up there and i just looked down and i saw all the people playing the games and serving food and having a wonderful social time and that little experience was a, i knew i was different you know and I love the people and I love baseball and I love the food and being out in nature, but I just saw myself as a part, you know, some, somehow that I just had a different way of, uh, of going. So I've been going that different way um, all along. And it's, and usually it's been in an extreme minority. And then even when I found myself in three year retreat, I developed a certain interest in um, Dzogchen, the Dzogchen teachings. And one of my fellows said, well, we're in the Shangpakakyu, we don't do Dzogchen, we do Mahamudra. So like, don't be reading that, you know, and, and don't, don't, you know, just leave that, you know, get back on track as it were. And so um, I decided that that was so compelling to me that that night before I went to bed, I prayed to Kala Rinpoche, my root lama, most significant teacher and my spiritual guide for an answer to this conundrum. And in the morning, as I woke up, I had a luminous dream um, the upshot of which is I went immediately back to reading that book and following that path. So even- What was the dream that you had? Well, I, I don't wanna talk about it too much, but a, a, a significant um, Dzogchen master appeared. And so I took that guidance of my dream rather than the guidance of my friend. And, and so that's what led me um, everywhere, you know, to the um, so I've just been fortunate enough on significant occasions to follow that. So then when I got into the third year of the three-year retreat and we're doing those six yogas, um, I felt just like when I was walking and, and, and Anam Tutor Rinpoche told me it's an archetype, the, I, I felt that somehow everything had led up to this day, as there's a Grateful Dead song that says that, everything just led up to this experience right here. And wow, how wonderful. So someone one time said, when the window of opportunity opens, don't pull down the shade. And so many times in my life, I've pulled down the shade and went, oh no, it couldn't be, it can't be, you know, no. 
Um, but then sometimes, like being in the three-year retreat, you're just doing that practice in your room by yourself. So there's no one to hinder you from letting go. And then doing the poa, you have to yell, you have to scream this sound, and it's ridiculous and embarrassing. But somehow I was far enough along that I didn't care, you know, what people thought. And people afterwards even made some comments about me, you know. But then again, I had an authentic experience that's just as real as the one I'm having right now with you. Um, and so that happened to me. What happened during that, that your poem? What was that experience? Well, I was able to have um, in the poa. So there are about 10 people that witnessed this. Um, when, when you train with the ejection of consciousness, you train all day long. So we did um, four two and a half hour practice sessions each day. But then those were punctuated by a morning group session doing practice together in the temple and an evening practice in the temple. And then later on when we were doing the six yogas, then we would do that physical body Tibetan yoga as well, true core. And so it's punctuated by those things. Those things are done with the, in group. And then you're back for the 10 hours by yourself and then sleeping by yourself um, in your own little room. Um, so the, um, so you practice all, so I think everything that you've done in your whole life is leading up to doing this practice, but then the whole three year retreat is preparing you as well. The different physical body yogas that you're doing. Um, so I was able to have an experience of um, ejecting my consciousness, but then the poa is unique and that there's a verification that happens. So it's said about the story of Shakyamuni Buddha's life that when he left the ascetic six year retreat experience and he decided to go more the middle way, then a young girl gave him something to drink uh, some kind of dairy product. It uh, seems to be unclear in different people's translations of the text. Um, and then a man gave him kusha grass, a type of grass to that the, in India today, they still make the brooms in India and Nepal. You see women sweeping floors with the grass broom. And it's that same grass. It's called kusha grass. And so, um, so then at, at, after a few weeks of tr trying to do the poa, practice it's like there's an exam and you come and kneel before the lama and the lama like picks through your hair and see if there's any sign at the back of your and top of your head um and if possible he tries to stick a hard piece of this kusha grass down into your skull and uh on my head he was able to do that and so I actually went for three days with this piece of kusha grass stuck down into my skull. Um, and the skull had opened up from doing the poa practice. So this happens to some people and some people it doesn't that, that do the practice. And it happened to me. And then um, when he put that kusha grass down, you know, into that point in my head is an indescribable feeling of going through, you know, the whole body. I don't know how even to begin like electricity or something, you know, going through the whole body. But so that was, um, so then to my rational doubting mind, you know, like if I would doubt the experiences I had in dream yoga or doubt the experiences I had in the illusory body practice, this is undeniable. He stuck his, into to you know stuck the stick into the opening in the top of my head and that's impossible to do without you know i mean the skull's pretty hard and i suppose you could jam it down in there you know but then this that it's a piece of grass like straw so it seems like it would break you know but then mm -hmm. And then twice the the upper robe that you wear uh, the monks wear is uh, and we're monks in that retreat for three years it was called a Zen. But I was in the kitchen and I threw my Zen up over my head because I was trying to cook and the Zen was in the way. And I threw it up over the top of that stalk of, of kusha grass. And it still remained. For, so it was way down in my head. So that was like empirical evidence if I needed it, you know. But then the experiences I had that 
then they resonated with the experience I had when I first did LSD and then subsequently did LSD numerous times. I don't remember how many times, maybe a few dozen times. Um, I decided at one point back in the 70s that LSD was my guru. You know, it's my spiritual guide in life. <laughs> so you mentioned there you, your experience with POA and also with dream yoga. And uh, you said there were at least three of those yogas that you had powerful experience with. I suppose the other one would be illusory body yoga, given that's the one you listed. Yes. Is that correct? Uh -huh. what, what experience did you have with illusory body yoga? Well, I'm not real comfortable with talking about it. I've, I've never really talked about it, but I had an out of body experience. Um, and um, one of the things that happens in dream yoga is it's pro progressive thing, but you try to recognize that you're dreaming, first of all. So, and then um, you can wake up in your dream. So you can recognize that you're dreaming and then you're awake and you're conscious in your dream. So you recognize that I am dreaming, just like right now I'm sitting at the desk uh, talking with you and I recognize that obviously, you know? And so, but you have the same experience in dream. But then you realize that in the dream body, if you will, um, you're not hindered as you are in the physical body. So if you get some notion, you know, like maybe some remembrance of a wonderful weekend that you had in Rio or something or anywhere, you know, um, then you can go there. And so then you take charge of the dream experience like that and transform it. And so then because you can go anywhere. So one person that I knew um, doing the practice with me, you know, in his own little house, but we shared afterwards, said that when he reached that state, well, first he had an experience that his consciousness was up in the corner of his room, looking down at his body sleeping. And then he realized he, he woke up in the dream and then he could go anywhere. And so he was from a very beautiful South American city and he used to walk to school um, down this street um, where there were brick walls and the houses were like mansions and beautiful homes. And there were all these, this greenery like trees and things growing over and it was just a beautiful walk. And so Zap, he was there he went there and had that experience again. And so you could say that was um, a very cool experience, an amazing experience of a person doing something completely different with their mind without LSD, you know, just with their own body and their own practice and their own mind. Um, and, and so um, I had an experience like that, but it wasn't of this world. I decided to go somewhere else. Where did you go? Well, I, I, I don't think I want to talk about it. <laughs> That's fine. You don't have to talk about it, but I do have to ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, but it was, um, like I say, it was, a, it was as real as this. And then it, that only has to happen for one second right? To have that experience for one second, and you know that it's real. Wow. It's just like if someone says to you, so-and-so is visiting town, maybe some famous celebrity or something, and then you just happen to be at the market, and, uh, and you look up and see the person for one second, and then they're, they're just crossing, you know, but then you know that's true, because you saw that for one second. So it was kind of, it was a little bit more than one second maybe, but, but it was an experience like that. So, so then when you hear about the teachings, when you read in the books about the teachings of the experiences of the great masters, there's a veridicity, there's a, you know, you, you believe in that. You, you recognize that, well, just to put it my way, you recognize that that's true because you've had the glimpse. You know, one time I was driving out west, I used to travel around the west uh, a lot, the western U.S., hitchhiking and driving both. And um, I saw the sunset twice, you know, the 
driving down in, in, in southern Utah. And you would think, you know, that's impossible, you know, like the sun goes down and it's down, you know, but if you're driving in the mountains, you're going up and down. And, uh, and so you just need like that experience just one time. And then, you know, that can definitely happen. And then someone could say, well, maybe you were dreaming or maybe it was, you know, a drug experience or whatever. And you know, no, it was this clearest day I experienced that I saw. Or an eclipse was a beautiful example a full eclipse of the sun. If you have that experience just one time, it's life altering. I was taking care of the home of some friends of mine that like actually live in the same valley that now we live in. And um, they had about a half a dozen horses and a dog and then some house plants. And so I was taking care of them. They were traveling somewhere at the time that this eclipse was going to happen. And it was gonna be at 11, uh, in the morning. And so I went outside and when I went outside some minutes in advance of the eclipse, the dog just pressed himself. It was a big dog, just pressed himself next to my leg and wouldn't be separated from me. And he was usually gambling away, you know, I'm just happy being a dog in the mountains. Uh, but that day he's not going anywhere. He's just stuck right on. And then a couple of minutes later, I noticed that the horses were in a pen that was maybe a half acre or so. And the horses started to run around in a circle, like frantically, frenetically, wildly. They were all together in a band really tightly close together again. And they were just running and running and running in a circle. And, and so their uh, sensitivity was greater than mine, the animals. And to me, it was just like an ordinary day. Uh, it was a winter day, 11 o'clock in the morning. I think maybe it was March, but I'm not sure. Um, and then the eclipse began to happen. And this, so there's the sun, totally manifest and obvious. And then slowly, part of it starts to disappear. And when the eclipse happened, when the eclipse part actually started to happen, all the horses stopped and they all came to one corner of the fenced area and put their heads down together. So they knew something was happening significant and so did the dog. And then, you know, it was just, and then it was nighttime and the stars all came out. It's 11 o'clock. I mean, this is like mundane now for I mean, lots of people experience this and know about that because we have the internet and, be, you know, we're informed of when that's going to happen by the scientists and whatnot. But still, just to experience that for yourself for one time, not on television or anything. For me, it's a life altering experience. Like, whoa. And so then it confirms what the scientists say, you know, about where we live and that, you know, how the solar system works, you know, and that it, it's totally astounding, but it completely miraculous at the same time, even though, you know, some staid astronomer could say, well, yes, the math actually proves that and it's going to happen at this time and in this place and last this long and yeah, 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 just like that. So it could be regarded as quite pedestrian, but on the other hand, completely miraculous. But if one doesn't go outside, if one doesn't, you know, uh, take that step just to go outside and check it out, you know, and see, um, then then it becomes like abstract, something that someone else is just reporting. And then, then you don't know, is it just idle speculation or fantasy or what on their part? But then you just see it one time, then, uh, I think that's life changing. And so those kind of experiences, they're not to be lived for, they're not the goal of the spiritual life, but they can be very helpful to like a beginner confused person like myself. They can be clarifying and encouraging and inspiring. Yeah, literally inspiring. Um, and so then one wants to continue on such a path that with, with, contains such beauty, you know, such beautiful experiences. And then one becomes, um, so then one is no longer what I call the true believer, you know, the naive young person that doesn't know anything about philosophy or psychology or religion, and it falls in love with how kind and loving a Tibetan teacher might be, and then adopts that, you know, the a Tibetan name and a Tibetan style of dress, maybe, and, and the Tibetan as a religion. So I, I, just in my own vocabulary and the way that I use words myself, I make a clear distinction between religion and spirituality. So the spiritual path is, you know, what we're talking about 
and then religion is connected, you know, <laughs> they're related, but not the same thing. And when people take up with things religiously, then there's a very strong tendency to be dualistic about that, to reify. And sometimes I talk about reification as other eyes. We otherize people that think a different way or look a different way or whatever. Wonderful. David, I'm aware of the time and I know you have a meeting. So oh. I think we're out of time, but I would love <laughs> to do a sequel because I have so many more questions here and you've opened up so many more questions than even I'd prepared. And we haven't even scratched some of the topics I wanted to ask you about. So what, what do you say to doing a part two in, in uh, some weeks time? Yeah, I think I'd like to do that. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's a little bit egotistic. I'm talking about myself, but uh well, I'm asking, so I'm asking yeah, about yeah. yourself, so you can blame me if you like. <laughs> and so if you're interested, then may maybe other people might be interested. And I think I'm, um, so when you go into the, I'll just conclude with a, a final anecdote. When you go into the three-year retreat, sometimes it's your idea, like I'm going to do that. I think that would be a great thing to do. And and my case, I was told that I should do it. And then I immediately began to negotiate, to bargain, you know, because that's kind of a scary thing to think about sleeping in a box, sitting up straight, not lying down for three years, having no heat and Burgundy's damp and not that much different from Britain or Montana weather-wise. Um, so the abbot of the center told me that I should do the next retreat. So I immediately, then knew that there was a letter that Colin Rinpoche had written of four prerequisites to doing the, the three-year retreat. And I think I scored about 10% on the pre-qualifications. And so I went to the retreat master that came from old Tibet. There was a meditation master from Tibet that Colin Rinpoche sent to be the retreat master for the first ever retreat in the West. So he's not just gonna send some ordinary guy, you know, he's gonna send an expert. And so this guy, and then he had taught, was in the process of teaching the third cycle of three-year retreats there, plus he had taught them at other centers. And so I thought he is the man, the maybe the, one of the world experts on the three-year retreat. I'll go have an interview with him and talk about this. So I brought that letter with me. And um, I said, so the abbot says that I should do the next three-year retreat, but I think that I should prepare for another three or four years. I should learn Tibetan and I should do some of these things on the letter here, fulfill some of these qualifications. And so I went down them one by one. And the first one, I don't know if I can remember all four right now, but the first one is you have to um, have done the preliminary practices. And I told him, I haven't even begun them. And he just looked at me and said, that's okay, you'll do a good retreat. And then the next one was, you're supposed to have like thousands of dollars, you know, in 19, whenever that was, I think it was about $15,000. And we were penniless. We got our furniture from the dumpster and, um, and we lived at the Dharma Center in this little room. Um, and so we were you know, close to penniless. We didn't have money for airfare to go back to the States, for instance. Um, and then we were actually illegally in France a lot of the time we were there. Um, so we were really um, you know, kind of like Dharma refugees. And, and each one of the four things that I said like that, I don't know Tibetan. He said, that's okay, you'll do a good retreat. So that was like his trump card that he played on every card that I played. And so I felt checkmated and I said, I guess I'm okay, <laughs> you know? And so I went into it uh, kind of like that. So just totally ridiculous, you know? So you were supposed to know how to make tormas and play all these instruments and know all the rituals. And I knew none of that. So. So I really was like I've often been, I was the village idiot in a three-year retreat and I didn't speak French. So, so, so I said, said to the Lama, well, I, you know, the, the Lama that's teaching doesn't speak, you know, um, I mean, he's gonna be teaching in Tibetan. And the Lama said, that's eh, okay, everything's translated. Well, it was translated into French, you know? So, so then I did, you know, so in every like kind of qualification, you know, like like it was a job application or, or applying to, uh, you know, college or something. Like no, not this guy, not this guy. You know, like no, no, no. And then somehow um, I 
in a way found myself uh, there. And so I'm deeply grateful to Kala Rinpoche and the whole Tibetan lineage and, and the people that made that center happen and held that together um, for all the years, you know, since uh, Kala Rinpoche founded it. And some French people saw him at Samye Ling, actually. And, and then went, this, <laughs> this teacher is amazing. We have to bring him to France. And that's how he, he got to France in a word. But um, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more on another occasion. I, I had a lot of stage fright coming in. Um, and then um, I, um, I was on a friend's suggestion. I was looking at her Dharma Center's website. And as soon as I went to that website, then there you were interviewing um, the the Aro lineage people, uh, Chugum, um, and uh, and the Kondro. And so I thought that was, well, what a coincidence. And I said to myself, oh, I really should do this interview with Steve. But then that night, and then it was in the morning, um, I had a dream of us uh, having this conversation and having quite a good time. So that dream's come true, and I thank you very much. It certainly has. This has been such a wonderful conversation. Uh, well, until the sequel, Lama David Curtis, thank you very much. You're very welcome, Steve. Been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.